You can probably remember a pay-per-view or two in which the crowd was audibly angry at the end of the night. Whether it was because they found the matches terrible, the swerves nonsensical, the booking insulting, or some combination therein, the sound of abject disgust has been heard over a number of pay-per-view sign-offs. And there's nothing wrong with that. A ticket buying customer is free to verbalize their critique through that means. Though that sort of response is not unusual, it is unusual when a crowd dumps all over a pay-per-view from the start of the night. Now on July 14th, 1991, a crowd of 9,300 fans attending WCW's Great American Bash at the Baltimore Arena chose to air their grievances throughout the evening. That's because days before the card, a controversial decision was made by the head man in charge at WCW, and the attendees were going to use that forum to register their outrage. What followed was an atrocious pay-per-view, soundtracked by borderline mutinous crowd. Crowd. The 1991 Great American Bash is one of the worst shows ever. The first half of 1991 in WCW had its ups and downs. Perception-wise, the number two promotion in the United States was a clear number two, no pun intended. And for one thing, WCW's production and presentation were miles behind WWF, the unquestioned industrial leader. Though WCW did have a number of valuable stars in its camp, the company was still viewed in most corners as inferior to the glossier World Wrestling Federation. Standing out among the deep roster, you had Sting, the superhero that combined the ultimate warrior's face-painted mystery, Hulk Hogan's tangible humanity, and Charlie Brown's inability to see a double cross coming a mile away. There were the Steiner brothers, the suplex-dispensing siblings that tortured opponents through barely concealed smiles. There was Lex Luger, sculpted like a Frank Franzetta creation, come to life. The total package had all the physical characteristics of a wrestling world champion, but had famously come up short in several marquee challenges. Then there was the man that always managed to hold him off, the nature boy, Rick. Flair. Save for some spells where Sting or Harley Race or Dusty Rhodes or Ricky Steamboat ran with the gold, Flair had basically been world champion since 1981, tending to only lose it for a little while here and there. From the time Flair first became NWA world champion after beating Rhodes in 81, and up to this point, Sting and Race were the only wrestlers besides Flair that reigned as champion for more than 100 days. Otherwise, Nate was master and commander of the Crockett territory and remained the man following the changeover into Ted Turner's organization. Just as important as having the faith of the matchmaker, Flair was an institution in the eyes of the fans. Blessed with otherworldly charisma and rare ring gentlemanship, Flair could equally talk the talk and walk the walk, something legions of supporters caught on to, whether he was a face or a heel. The so-termed 60-minute man could carry any schlub to the match of their life and routinely achieve brilliance with peers of comparable stock. Now simply put, Ric Flair was a one-of-a-kind performer and fans and fellow wrestlers alike recognized that. Even at 42 years of age with nearly two decades of wear on his tires, Flair had few peers between the ropes. At the time this story begins, Flair was the reigning WCW World Heavyweight Champion, the first title holder of the belt's lineage, which began in January 1991, following WCW's separation from the NWA. And technically, he was also the NWA World Champion at this point too, having beaten Tatsumi Fujinami in a title-for-title -title bout at Super Brawl on May 19th. It's all very confusing, try not to dwell on this part. Flair was scheduled to defend the WCW title in the main event of the 1991 Great American Bash in Baltimore. One year earlier, Flair dropped his championship at the same event in the same city to Sting, giving the Stinger his first ever world championship. In 1991, Flair was once more going to do the honors for another first time champion. In all, 11 matches were booked for the bash, attractions that ran the gamut from must see to, well, I guess you gotta have some filler. And on the lower end, you had some of WCW's more woeful attempts at creating WWF-like cartoon characters. The allegedly great and powerful Oz was matched up against ascending powerhouse Ron Simmons, while good-natured lumberjack Big Josh would face medieval executioner Black Blood in, well, what else but a lumberjack match. The 7-7 Elegante would continue his monster push by facing the mostly directionless 450 pound one-man gang. The Diamond Stud, aka Scott Hall, doing most of his Razor Ramon mannerisms while playing a male stripper, was set to face fellow ladies' man Tom the Z-Man Zenk. 
a banished Brian Pillman had secretly returned under a mask and tights as the Yellow Dog and would face Johnny B. Bad, whose portrayal of a flamboyant ex-boxer was, well, shall we say, short on ambiguity at this stage of the game. One true curiosity was the battle of longtime tag team partners as Robert Gibson would face former Rock and Roll Express partner Ricky Morton, or Richard Morton, following a heel turn that led him to join the decidedly corporate York Foundation. In multi-person action, young Steve Austin would team with Terence Taylor to face Bobby Eaton and PN News, pro wrestling's preeminent rapper, prior to Bo Ryder in a scaffold match. A six-person tag was booked with the Steiner brothers and Missy Hyatt facing Arn Anderson, Barry Windham and the detestable Paul E. Dangerously. Hard to say what the bigger draw was, seeing Hyatt rough up Heyman for all of his misogynistic comments, or Scott Steiner doing the math to figure out how much money Heyman will one day owe the ECW locker room. There was also a trios elimination match, in which the Freebirds, including short-lived member Bad Street, aka a masked Brad Armstrong, would face the Young Pistols and 22-year-old Dustin Rhodes, who was in the midst of a sustained push from Booker and father, Dusty that some find a little bit premature. Now, young Dustin would go on to justify that early push throughout his storied and illustrious three-decade career, but in 1991, critics were a little bit skeptical of Rhodes' worthiness. Meanwhile, in a Russian chain match, Nikita Koloff would go one-on-one -on -one with the ever-popular Sting, whom he'd recently taken out at Super Brawl with said chain. In the main event, world champion Flair would defend his gold against US champ Lex Luger inside of a steel cage. After several years of coming up short in title matches, this was to be Luger's big moment. His moment of ascendance, the night he could finally slay the dragon, cast off that choke artist label and put Flair down for the count to become a world champion, finally. Now, seems like a pretty hard plan to screw up, right? Well, venture a guess who managed to screw it up. If you want a hint, their initials backwards spelled W C W. Will that show up backwards? C? The realists should have seen it coming. It was all going far too well. WCW had two pay-per-views in 1991 that were well above average. A brilliant wrestle war that concluded with a dramatic War Games match and a mostly great Super Brawl that gave us the highly acclaimed Sting and Luger vs Steiner's bout that easily rates among WCW's all-time greatest tag matches. That's not even counting the excellent joint card they had with New Japan in March that one might consider a precursor to Forbidden Door. They had a rising star in 26-year-old Austin. The upper half of the card was loaded with genuine talent and recognisable stars, and Dusty had returned as Booker in January, and he'd had many brilliant ideas in his earlier tenures. On the surface, a WCW fan had a reason to be optimistic. Not too deep in the underbelly, though, there were problems between the champion and the boss. The man running WCW as its executive vice president at the time was a fellow by the name of Jim Hurd. Prior to getting the WCW gig at the dawn of 1989, Hurd had a long and storied history, rendering tough decisions in the complex world of professional wrestling. Well, actually, that's not true. Hurd's resume included once running a TV station, and he was the regional manager for a pizza hut. Not sure how either of those prepares anyone to oversee a wrestling product. But you know, there was an important quality Hurd possessed that made him a natural to run WCW. He was friends with one of Turner's top executives, a man named Jack Petrick. Now, suddenly, Dusty giving his firstborn son a sizable push doesn't seem so egregious now, does it? While Hurd employed a number of veteran wrestling minds to book the in-ring end of things, he still loomed large over the organisation. Infamously, Hurd came up with the Ding Dongs, a tag team that wore bells on their bodies, dinging and donging on their way to the ring, to the enjoyment of no one. Think long and hard about this one. At one time, somebody with power trusted this man to visit different pizza huts and make sure Space Invaders was properly plugged in. The issues between Hurd and Flair, however, were no game. As stories have it, Hurd wanted the aging Flair to drastically update his look and take a substantial pay cut. The two had been at odds for a long time, with Flair quitting the booking committee in 1990 due to Hurd's reported meddling. He even refused to drop the title to Luger that year at Hurd's request, insisting on waiting for an injured Sting to return and then lose it to him, as was the original plan. By 1991, the impasse over money grew more contentious, as Flair was refusing to accept a pay cut of half his annual salary. 
Due to all of this accrued acrimony, after Flair dropped the WCW World title to Luger on July 14th at the Bash, there would understandably be many questions about his future with the company. It was a very delicate situation, one that required powerful and important men to put their egos aside in order to solve it. After all, Flair needs to keep a level head in order to make Luger's win special in the all-important title match. And Hurd needs to not underestimate Flair's value and importance, and he needs to realise how much of WCW's core audience idolises Flair, even if he's the heel. So again, all parties need to work together. Cooler heads will prevail and will ultimately win the d bollocks. So yeah, on Monday, July 1st, 13 days before Flair was to put Luger over in the world title match on a major pay-per-view, Jim Hurd fired his world champion. He fired the world champion. The world champion. The world champion. Wait, wait, hold on. It gets even dumber. Because of the ongoing Flair and Hurd deadlock, they actually came up with amended plan where Flair would lose the world title at a TV taping that night, Monday, July 1st, in Macon, Georgia, to a former fellow horseman, Wyndham, who would then transition the title onto Luger at the bash while Flair and Hurd continued their tense negotiations. Right, okay. It kind of screws up Luger's big moment, since him specifically beating Flair for the title would have been a poetic end to his years of futility. But whatever. He's, he's still getting the belt. However, before Flair could leave his house on that Monday to head to Macon and put Wyndham over, Hurd faxed a letter to Flair's attorney, Dennis Guthrie, informing him that they were terminating Flair's contract with advance notice. Now, Hurd had had enough of the ongoing stalemate and simply told Flair, to hell with you. So that was that. His nuisance was gone. Hurd probably dusted his hands, fixed himself his favourite drink, popped onto his favourite chair and thought, that's the end of the Ric Flair problem. Then it dawned on him. Oh crap. I fired Ric Flair before he lost the belt inside the ring. Oh crap, that means Ric Flair is still the world champion. Oh crap, that means Ric is still in possession of the actual belt. Indeed, Flair had the world title belt in his possession and he was going to hold it for ransom. And apparently, Flair kind of had the right to do so. See, in the olden days of the NWA, the world title holder placed a $25,000 deposit upon gaining possession of the physical belt, and that money would be returned to them upon dropping it. This prevented the champion from pulling any funny business while holding the belt, if he wanted to get his money back, that is. Now, according to Flair, because he held the belt so frequently, he never bothered to collect this money upon losing the title, since he'd be winning it back quickly enough anyway. But now it looks like he's out of a job, so he'd like his money back, please. With interest, you assholes. Hurd refused to give in to Flair's demands, so Flair sent the belt to Vince McMahon and the WWF, correctly figuring that this was going to be his next place of employment. Apparently, people named Hurd had been pooping the bed in spectacular fashion for a long time. Two days after this bonehead decision was carried out, WCW ring announcer Gary Michael Capetta announced at a house show in New Jersey that Flair had been stripped of the belt, prompting a crowd of 6,000 people to react with unbridled hostility. The fans were pissed, and even in the age of sparser internet access, word spread quickly. Enough fans in Baltimore knew come July 14th what the story was, that Flair was no longer the champion and he was effectively persona non grata in the organisation he'd carried for years. Obviously, the bash card had to be reconfigured. Suddenly, Luger would be facing Wyndham in a top contenders match inside a steel cage for the vacant belt. This necessitated pulling Wyndham from the six-person tag he was booked for. This was just as well since Scott Steiner was sidelined with an injury. This meant that Rick Steiner and Missy Hyatt would face Anderson and Dangerously instead. As those running the show, and especially Hard, would quickly learn, no amount of reshuffling was going to keep this ship from hitting something immovable and dense. As Dave Meltzer wrote in the post-mortem, WCW had its first chance to prove it could survive without Ric Flair. By the end of Great American Bash, a show Ric Flair could not have saved, the only thing proven was that Flair was worth far more to the company than it ever realised. Speaking of the bash, let's delve into the show, shall we? And you know what? Let's make this an interactive video. Those of you watching, feel free to boo incessantly and occasionally chant, we want flair, while I rattle off these match results. It's like being there in person. We kick things off with the scaffold match, with Eaton and News facing Austin and Taylor. Unfortunately, this particular scaffold was built a little far too narrow for any action to take place high above the ring, so the wrestlers kind of just shuffled and crawled, moving at a pace anywhere between Glacial and Mosey. 
So you may be wondering, who took the big fall to end the match? The future Stone Cold? The former Rooster? The experienced Midnight Expresser? Or the £400 news? The answer is E. None of the above. Instead, the match ended when Eaton retrieved a flag from one side of the scaffold and returned it to his side. Yes, this match was capture the flag rules and nobody told the very confused audience or Jim Ross and Tony Schiavone on commentary because they seemed dumbfounded as Eaton tightrope the scaffold, flag in hand, and the participants just started climbing down the sides of the structures as if to say, well, that's enough of that. You know how Bret Hart versus Owen Hart is the greatest pay-per-view opener of all time? This would be the diametric opposite of that. Hell, it's probably Austin's worst match ever, so it's at least got that bit of cocktail trivia going for it. For those of you out there like to keep score, Uncle Dave awarded that match a negative three and a half stars. Though, let's face it, Big Daddy Melts is biased against American wrestling, because this is easily negative two if it was in the Tokyo Dome. The announcers had to stall for a bit while the scaffolding was disassembled. Nothing better to follow an excruciatingly painful match than even more excruciatingly painful dead air. Obviously, this is Ted Turner's dollars going to good use. Now, the next match wasn't too shabby as the outsider Razor Stud defeated Zink in a decent TV bout. This was followed by other outsider, Big Daddy Oz, taking the fall to Simmons, who was being quite heavily pushed at this time. While Simmons was up to the push, Kevin Nash in 1991 was as green as the tights he wore, though better days would certainly be ahead for him. This match drew some audible, boring chants from the crowd, and Simmons finished after eight minutes with a diving shoulder block. Hard to say if that was better or worse than the 17 minute snooze fest between the estranged Rock and Roll Express members. Morton and Gibson together made for one of the most exciting tandems of their era. But on this Baltimore night, they were apt to sleepwalk through a very lengthy match where Morton worked over Gibson's bad knee for more than 10 minutes. This was followed by Rhodes and the Pistols, winning the elimination match over the three Freebirds after another 17 minute match. And while there was more action here than in the previous match, it just didn't click, especially after some stalling early on. And the elimination rule was kind of moot, seeing as the first one didn't take place until almost 14 minutes in, Rhodes overcame two on one odds to win in the end, and the push persisted. So, a quick look at Meltzer's rating so far. <laughs> We're talking a lousier first half than Liverpool and Istanbul. And unfortunately for Heard, Dusty and the rest of the office, there won't be any miracle comeback. Bad versus Dog, known in some circles as Bad Dog Match, ended in a DQ after six minutes. This was followed by Eric Bischoff trying to interview Missy Hyatt while she was taking a shower in one of those segments that probably wouldn't fly today. Next was the Lumberjack match, which also went about six minutes and ended with Big Josh winning with a small package after avoiding an in-match beheading. No, really, Black Blood actually went and got his axe with the apparent intention of using it. Pretty sure that would have resulted in at least a small fine. Next up was the titanic struggle between Elegante versus Gang. Gang was seconded by Kevin Sullivan, whereas Elegante was escorted by four little people for some reason. I guess this was to make the 7-7 Elegante look really tall, but come on. Though impressive in size, Elegante was a bad wrestler due to an uncooperative body, and this match wouldn't be an exception to his obvious limits. The giant Argentinian managed to win after kicking white powder in the gang's face and then clotheslining the back of one man gang's head. Now forget the spear followed by a jackhammer. When you're talking killer two-part finishes, the conversation begins and ends with kicking suspicious white granules into someone's eyes, followed by a rudimentary forearm club to the back of the head. So, let's check Meltzer's updated scorecard and yeesh. It takes two to make things go right, but it's gonna take at least a two star match to make the bash even remotely watchable, or at least two drinks, minimum. And thank God, we get there with Sting and Koloff. Before this match, the Baltimore crowd had exactly three stock responses. Boo, where the hell is Flair, and elective coma. This match introduced a fourth one. Cool, Sting's here, he doesn't suck. So yeah, Sting rules, Koloff's a convincing badass, and there was enough storyline heat to make the fans care. It'd been a rough night with all the negative energy, bad matches, and well, overriding sense of impending doom, but Sting and Koloff managed to end about two hours of hopeless futility. 
Unfortunately, WCW couldn't give its audience an ending they'd actually find cathartic. Sting lost after Koloff touched the four corners before he did. You'd think you'd throw the hostile audience a bone by letting the most popular star on the roster win their match, but neither you or I are Jim Hurd, and unless Jim Hurd is watching this video, in which case, the ding-dongs, what the hell were you thinking? So, Sting lost, but fear not. Another hero would get the win in the next match at least. Well, sort of. Lex Luger's long winding world title chase was about to come to an end inside of a solid steel cage. He wasn't going to beat Flair, so beating Wyndham would have to do. Just get Luger the win, it's all you can ask for. That said, the following statements about the Luger and Wyndham match are unfortunately true. One, the We Want Flair chants were at their loudest and most combative before and during the match, but you probably could have guessed that. Two, because Flair had sent the belt to McMahon, WCW resorted to using an old nondescript title belt with a cheap looking World Championship Wrestling wordplate crudely fixed to the top of it. According to Luger, Dusty instructed him to avoid holding the belt in the air after he won, because the Dream didn't want photographers getting quality photos of the new champion holding up a belt that looked like something out of a backyard wrestling company. 3. Undercutting Luger's watershed moment was the fact he inexplicably turned heel late in the match. New manager Harley Race and bodyguard Mr. Hughes provided a late match distraction to Wyndham, allowing Luger to use Race's pile driver on Bray and Bo's uncle to win. And 4. Despite a hostile crowd, a trash bag title belt, a heel turn from out of left field, and a somewhat truncated 12 and a half minute runtime, Luger vs Wyndham was still easily the match of the night. Well, it wasn't ideal, but all's well that ends well enough. At least there was something good to go out on, and that's the video. What do you mean, there's, there's one more match to go? Okay, for some strange reason, they saved the modified mixed tag for last. WCW in the early 90s for you. Well, I guess you just have Rick Steiner and Missy Hyatt humiliate Arn Anderson and Paul E. dangerously to send the crowd home happy, right? Except they couldn't even do that, right? As it turns out, there's a Maryland State Athletic Commission rule that bars intergender confrontations, something that WCW probably wasn't aware of when they advertised this match for weeks on TV. So what happened was Hyatt was taken out before the match when heel duo the hardliners kidnapped her. This left Steiner to pummel Anderson and Dangerously alone, winning the alleged main event in about two minutes. And that's it from Baltimore. Drive home safe, everyone. Christ, where to start with this? Only Luger and Wyndham was objectively good, while Sting and Koloff was decent. There was passable TV level matches here and there, sure, but that was on top of some genuinely awful and disappointing bouts. The flair fiasco was but the toothpick and olive that topped the bullcrap sandwich. Of the 241 respondents in the Observer's post-show poll, 239 of them gave the bash a thumbs down. Two readers mercifully went thumbs in the middle in what one assumes were acts of charity. And nobody went thumbs up. Observer readers later voted The Bash the worst major show of 1991, kicking off a run of WCW pay-per-views, taking home that honour in seven out of eight years. How different are things if Flair had stayed long enough to lose to Luger? Well, it's probably still a bad show given how the rest of the evening transpired, but at least there wouldn't be such a contentious atmosphere. Luger beating Flair inside the cage probably would have made for a joyous ending that salvaged things even just a little. Alas, Jim Hurd's monumentally dumb decision cast a dark, inescapable shadow over an already cruddy looking card. WCW fans wanted flair. They also wanted a show worth the price tag. And unfortunately, the 1991 Great American Bash gave them neither.